So the life of a Christian, what the ministry believes, the, the fundamentals, and um, the life of a Christian is also what me to talk to you about how I live my life as a Christian and how I motivate you, things for you to do for your life as a Christian. First thing is to learn how to pray. Um, I've had so many people that will come up to me uh, in comments and they'll ask me, how, how do you really pray? How do you have a really good prayer life? Okay. Uh, prayer, the first part is going to be prayers and hymns. Singing and praying. Why? Because both of them are verbally talking to the Lord. You're doing it for the Lord through your voice. Ephesians 5.19 Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Pray without ceasing. Okay, someone asked me. Um, I'm going to list out some things that hopefully kind of generalize what I do in prayer mostly, most of my time that I'm in prayer. But here's the thing. I think what confuses people is they think prayer is something where you have to get on your knees and bow your head or you've got to, you know, do this. Uh, that's called fervent prayer. And yes, there's times where I am closing my eyes when I pray and it helps me to focus hardcore. It's called fervent. You're trying to push everything out and you're just really focused on something that you really desperately need to talk to the Lord about or a request, which we're going to get to. Okay. But when you pray, you can talk to them too. You can be doing work around the house and your eyes are open, you're doing work and you're talking. It's like some people say it's like you're talking to yourself, but they don't know you're talking to God. I did a study where it talks about um, Daniel, no, Samuel, where his mother, before he was born, uh, they thought she was drunk because she, she was talking, she was moving her lips, but she wasn't, voice wasn't coming out. But she, what she was doing was lipping what she was talking to the Lord. And so I looked at her and thought she was drunk. Okay. You can sit there and still talk to the Lord. Uh, you're driving down the road. You don't have to close your eyes to talk to the Lord. You can talk to the Lord. I do a lot. I walk on the beach and talk with the Lord a lot. I sit out on my deck with my eyes open looking at the beauty that He's created. Um, and I talk with the Lord. I talk with the Lord all the time. And I think that's what would help. When it says pray without ceasing, it's not talking about um, uh, that you have to pray non-stop. I think what that really means is that you're supposed to have a really healthy prayer life. You should be praying to God a lot. You should never cease to come to the Lord in prayer about anything and everything. You go to the Lord in prayer for everything. Everything. There's nothing too embarrassing, uh, too prideful, nothing that's, that you cannot take to the Lord in prayer. Okay. So the first thing I do a lot in my prayers, I give God thanks in all things. One of the things about this ministry is we're trying to promote a healthy prayer life. Okay. Giving God thanks in all things. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, thank God. I thank God all the time for saving me. I don't know how often brothers and sisters in Christ out there that you do it. I thank God all the time for that He saved a wretch like me. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank Him for everything I have in my life. The physical stuff. I thank Him for all the good things that happen. I thank Him for protecting me from the bad. Um, and what's hard is giving him thanks for things that you don't know why it's happening, but you're like, Lord, I trust you. You know what you're doing. Okay. Colossians 3.17, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and, and the Father by him. Someone gets saved because I preached the gospel to him. Thank you, Lord. Not, ooh, Lord, look at what I did. Look what I did. No, thank you, Lord. Okay, I'm able to accomplish something. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I lost something and I found it. It wasn't me that found it. God, I'd be like, Lord, because I talk to him all the time. Lord, I can't find this. Where is it? I'm getting frustrated. And God, will, for some reason, you'll have this thing in your head saying, look over there. It's God. And I'll look over there and go, there it is. Thank you, Lord. And it just comes out naturally now. Thank you, Lord. Just thanking the Lord. 
Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I believe in prayer. And one of the things you do in your prayer is you give thanks to God in all things. Always remember to be giving God thanks. Uh, the next thing, giving God the glory in all things. This is the hard part, in a sense that this is also what I'm talking about when it comes to when things happen that don't go your way and, and you don't know why it happened. Uh, God's the one that let it happen. He knows what He's doing. And this isn't talking about if I sin and I'm getting chastened, give God the glory, in the sense that that's a great thing. Uh, chastisement's good after the fact, but you're to fear it before the fact. What I mean by giving God the glory in all things is God chastens you and gets you back on track. You don't say, I got myself back on track. You give God the glory. He whipped me, I deserved it. And now he's got me back on the right path. Thank you, Lord. That's the point of giving God the glory in all things. Okay. God, I only was able to do this because of you. Romans 6, 27, 16, 27. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Philippians 4, 20. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Um, Philippians, oh no, Jude 125, to the only wise God and Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. Revelation 1 6, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Okay. Um, bottom line, we give God the glory in everything. So when I pray sometimes, i got to remember, and that's not always easy, to give God the glory. Thank Him for what He's done for me. And also give Him glory saying, this was you that did it, not me. I'm not only thanking you for it, but I'm giving you the credit because you're the one that did it. Give God the glory in all things. God saved me. I didn't save myself. Uh, making requests. There's times in my prayer that we will make requests. Philippians 4, 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Okay? You're going to be requesting things like, Lord, I need help in this. I need food. We're hurting for money. Uh, Lord, can you watch over our brother in Christ? Lord, can you do this? Can you do that? You're going to be making requests. That's part of the things you do in prayer, and I've done that. Okay. Another big thing you're going to do in prayer is asking for understanding when it comes to the Word of God. Uh, sometimes I pray a lot for God to give me the right words, especially before I do a video. Um, James, let's see. James 1.5 If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask, you do that with your voice, with your mouth, ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and that prayeth not, and it shall be given him. Okay? Part of your prayer life is going to be asking God for wisdom. It is. Uh, talk about forgiving sin. Uh, part of your prayer life is going to be coming before, the God, God, coming before God through Jesus Christ, broken, and confessing your sins to Him in prayer, saying, Lord, I, I screwed up again. I failed. I screwed up again. Please forgive me. Psalm 66, 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me, but verily God hath heard me, he hath attended to my voice of my prayer. Why do I like that verse? Iniquity is sin. You're not holding it in your heart when you come before the Lord in prayer saying, I screwed up. You're throwing it for the cross when you get saved, but you're still doing that as a saved sinner as you go through your walk with the Lord. You're still going to be coming to the Lord, throwing that sin at the foot of the cross saying, Lord, I screwed up. I dropped my cross. Because remember, uh, Jesus said to take up your cross, no, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Those three things. Why do you have to pick up your cross daily? Because you're going to be dropping your cross daily. We're not perfect just because we're saved. We are not perfect. I still sin every day. We drop our cross every day. But we go, Lord, I'm sorry. Something slips out, a word slips out that you're not supposed to say. You say, Lord... Please forgive me. Who you talk to, it's prayer. Even if it's something as simple as, Lord, forgive me for saying that. And you get back to doing what you're doing. That's called prayer. Okay? Um, 1 John 1.9 If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right. These are the main things you'll talk to the Lord about. Um, don't get me wrong, sometimes I talk to the Lord too, just about anything and everything. I'm trying to put something together or, uh, you know, you just get to the point where you get such a healthy prayer life, you need to still have reverence. Jesus is our King, our Lord, our Master, our Friend. I understand that. You have to have reverence. You're not supposed to be getting so like, what's up, buddy? You know, uh, the big guy upstairs, the big kahuna. You know, we're bros. And the, you need to still show some respect for who he is. But there's times I talk to him about anything. You can talk to God about anything. Okay? Uh, how to fix a car. I'm having a problem figuring this out, Lord. You know? What do you think of this? You know, you just, you're talking to him and God opens, his, opens your eyes and you see, okay, that's what was wrong with the car. You know, talk with God. He likes to hear from you. Okay. Next, the hymns. Ephesians 5.19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14.15. What is, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. That's what I'm helping you with. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. The understanding that I'm trying to bring to you guys is old hymns. I push and push old hymns. Why? Because they bring glory to God. That's the best way to say it. The old hymns that line up with the Bible, they bring glory to God. They don't feed your flesh. They don't get you worked up fleshly. Um... The best explaining I could do is when I worked out at the gym, which I don't do anymore. I mean, there's a lot of wickedness in this gyms, and I don't go to gyms anymore, and I don't push people going to gyms. Um, I'm against it. But when I used to work out at the gym, because I was in the military at one time, and I worked out at the gym, after I got saved, I came home, um, medically retired, and I still went to the gyms. And then after I got saved, the music I used to listen to to work out with got you all pumped up and you're just working out and you're just getting so into it and you just get such a great workout. Well, after I got saved, I started listening to old hymns. I started listening to Bible studies. Uh, Alexander Scorvey reading the Bible in a little earpiece as I was trying to work out. And you know what? It was like 10 times harder to work out to get the same workout I did before. Why? Because the music I used to listen to was fleshly. It would please the flesh and motivate the flesh. We're supposed to please God. And for thy pleasure we are and were created. Our job is to please God, not ourselves. We're not supposed to be pleasing the flesh, we're supposed to be putting it down. So I push the old hymns big time when it comes to singing to the Lord. Some people write songs. Um, sometimes I have a little keyboard and I'll play the same tune, and I'll, I'll do like a psalm. I'll go through a chapter in psalm, playing the tune and sing, singing the actual word of the Lord to the Lord uh, in psalms. So that's what I push for that. Okay? We need to, uh, as a Christian, once you get that down, that prayer life, which is so important, that's when you get into the reading and studying and living the word of God. Okay? 2 Timothy 2.15, we talked about this. Uh, study to show thyself approved unto God. You're, you're told you need to study. It's one of his commands. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Uh, John 17.17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You're commanded to study the Bible. You need to read it. You need to get a King James Bible and read it. Then you start studying it. You go through studies that you don't, like I did. My first year that I was saved, I came across King James, um, King James Video Ministries, Brother Brian, and I went through the Bible version issue, couldn't drop it. Then I started going through all these main subjects that I talked about, video after video about dispensational teaching, pre-time Jacob's trouble, eternal security, uh, Bible version issue, uh, the true gospel, and I just had such a love of the truth that I wasn't just reading the Bible, I was going hardcore with all these studies. Okay. That's what's going to happen when you first get saved. And as you go through these studies, that's when sanctifi sanctification is going to happen. There's studies on instruction and righteousness. Instruction and righteousness is the do's and the don'ts in the Bible. 
what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. Um, John 17, 17, uh, like we just talked about, sanctifying through thy truth, thy word is truth. Okay? That's when you start living for the word, uh, living the word of God. You start living for Jesus Christ, the changed life comes in when God starts opening the word to you and saying, hey, this is what you're supposed to believe. You see that over there? You're not supposed to be doing that. You're supposed to stay away from that. Uh, did you read your Bible this morning? Have, have you gone days without reading the Bible when you're not supposed to? I always tell people, you need to be reading the Bible daily. You need to be praying daily. You can't go a day without praying, and you can't go a day without reading the Word of God. Okay? Psalms 119, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Psalms 119.11, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Something I had to learn, brothers and sisters in Christ, when you're studying it, it's not enough to have it up here. It's got to make its way down here. You can have the knowledge, but it doesn't make it to your heart. And you're always like, why am I struggling so hard with this sin? Why am I struggling with this? Why am I been fighting this for 20 years or that and that? And my advice is, check your heart. See if the word is actually making it down to your heart. And most times it is. It is. And you're just having that struggle. Some people, there's different things. I have things that I struggled so hard with before God got me cleaned up. And he had to smack me around a little bit to get it cleaned up. Everybody has their different things, uh, sins that they struggle with. But one of the things I realized is I was trying to hold that sin in my heart, and in my head I knew it was wrong, but my heart was saying, I'm not going to give it up. It's okay. There's no big deal. It's not a big deal. And God really had to smack me around to get it down to my heart and say, uh, get my heart to say, okay, you know, it is wrong. I want to get rid of it. Help me, Lord. It's wrong. There is no justification for it, period. It's got to make it down to the heart. You hide the word in your heart. Memorize scripture. And then, not just memorizing, but every scripture you memorize, make sure to talk to yourself about it, saying, this is what it means, this is what it stands, and this is what it means to me, and this is what it means. You know, means to me, your heart, and it lines up with what it actually means. But it's something you take to heart. I highlight things in my Bible. Um, well, my wife was saying with instruction in righteousness, the whole book could, would be highlighted. And she's right. The whole book, New Testament to the Old Testament, um, there's tons of instruction in righteousness, but I explained to her that I solely highlight things that really apply to me at this point in time. And I'll look at some that I highlighted, the things that I struggled with in the past, and it reminds me. So I'm highlighting stuff that means something here. And as time goes by, <laughs> eventually the whole Bible is probably going to get highlighted, because all of it's good. But you know what I'm saying, okay? We're supposed to be reading, we're supposed to be studying it, and we're supposed to be hiding the Word of God in our heart. That's how you overcome sin, is the Holy Spirit will open the Scriptures to you so you can put them in your heart. And you can live it. Okay? Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, the battery looks like it's getting low, so. Um, so sanctification. I'm keeping my eyes on the battery. <laughs> uh, fellowship. Next part. The hardest thing in these last days, brothers and sisters in Christ, is fellowship. I do believe in fellowship. This ministry believes in fellowship. But you know it was the hard thing to distinguish between when I was first saved because I was deceived? Fellowship, social club. I was blurred because I wasn't taught the difference. And all it was was social club. There was no fellowship that I was told it was. But when you get saved, God starts through His Word, starts drawing a line saying, Okay, this over here is what real fellowship is. This is just a social club. And there for a while, I was fighting it because I, I missed the social, I missed the social club. And God had to drill it into me that that's not profitable and leads you astray when it becomes a social club. Um, there's nothing wrong with family getting together and having a barbecue. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, but when you come together saying, hey, we're going to do fellowship, and all it is is a social club, it's not going to help you. It's going to hurt you. True fellowship. Okay. 
Um, these battle buildings that I was going to, they were inviting lost people. 2 Corinthians 6.14 Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, plural, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And I have to stop for a second. Unbelievers, plural. They'll try to say this has to do with marriage. No, it has to do with unbelievable, all unbelievers. You're not supposed to be unequally yoked. And yes, that includes marriage for instruction in righteousness. You're not supposed to be married to someone who doesn't believe the King James Bible, who's not a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman. Okay? But this is talking about the world, the lost world. You're not supposed to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship? See, we're talking about fellowship. So verse 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? You know that the lost world, until they get saved, Satan can use them. I mean, God can too, but you know what I'm saying? Satan can use them to mess you up. He's got servants. The, um, Alberto Riviera, uh, Chick Comics, where he talks about how he was planted as a fake Christian to destroy churches and fellowships and everything. Okay? Uh, if you're lost, Satan can use you. Okay, and, and he will use, he has a lot of bad people out there. So, what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God, that's what you're supposed to be, with idols, the lost world? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." my people. See, there's still a distinction here. So the unbelievers is the lost world. It's not talking about marriage. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. Them, plural again, separate. Saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean things, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Okay? You are not to fellowship with the lost world. And in these last days, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ out there, fellowship is very hard to have face to face. I have fellowship with my wife. That's the only person I really get to have fellowship these last days face to face. Okay, we're spread out so thin. I talk to people sometimes on the computer, leaving comments, and a lot of people's like, that's not the same. And you're right, it's not. I'd rather have a house church that had like, you know, five to ten people that show up once a week where we get to talk about our faults, what we're struggling with, to get prayer, to learn the God, Word of God together, to encourage one another and strengthen one another. That's what true fellowship is. It's not talking about sports. It's not coming together and watching Super Bowl football and watching movies and playing video games and uh, huge barbecues and everything. That's not what true fellowship is. It's coming together to talk about the Word of God to pray for one another, to confess our faults one to another, to be held accountable, to be held accountable to the Word of God through one another. That's true fellowship. I would love to have it face to face, but in these last days, um, we're spread out far few in between, if I said it right. So, that's the thing. Uh, so fellowship's going to be hard to have face to face, but there's still, I have emails, I had put out an email that people can email me about testimonies and prayer, but I've also had Sisters in Christ ask me questions. Um, my wife has written to Sisters in Christ. Um, Brother Brian has some. JT, you can talk to JT at JT Does. I do sometimes. Um, you can still have a little fellowship um, through, through emails, um, calling people, actually verbally talking to people on the phone. That's still there. It hasn't been closed to us, but it might get worse before the time, before the end, uh, before the catching away of the body of Christ. So I understand that. I am a believer in fellowship. I really am. But it's very tough these last days. Okay, the next part is giving, tithing, and donations. Okay, a lot of people in these battle buildings are going to lie to you, deceive you, try to get your money, and tell you that you have to give a 10% tithe. That's not what the Bible teaches. 1 Timothy 5.18 For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. That I had to throw out there to say that there are ministries that if God has blessed you with extra money, you should donate to some of the ministries. Okay? Um, there's people that are in full-time ministry and they're working hard. I don't ask for donations because God's blessed me. 
He's got that taken care of. I don't need donations. Right? But when times happen that people need donations, whether it's for a ministry or you have a brother and sister in Christ that's hurting, um, like I said, if I had a, if we had a house church here and one, someone in the house church couldn't buy food, they paid their bills and they ran out of money, I'd take them to the store in a heartbeat and buy them $100 worth of groceries. Just like that. Brother in Christ, sister in Christ. God is I mean, if he's blessed me with having it, and I'm pretty sure he would because that's how God works, that we all work together to help one another. People have problem paying bills, uh, taking care of widows. Um, I understand that the individual family is responsible for taking care of the widow, but there's times where the widow doesn't have kids. Okay, uh, an elderly widow um, doesn't have kids. So the church steps up and says, okay, I'm going to help take care of her. Stop by her house, see how she's doing, you know, that kind of thing. But even financially sometimes, okay. People who are doing the work of the Lord, full-time ministry, they're worthy to be, to have, for people to donate their money. They're worthy of their reward, okay. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, but this is the attitude of the giver. They try to tell you, you have to give. That's not the attitude of the giver. This is what the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Every man according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, but for God love loveth a cheerful, cheerful, I can't even say it, talk to them, cheerful giver. Okay? You're going to give out of your heart, the purpose in your heart, and not grudgingly or of necessity. So there's times where God's going to tell you it might be a great ministry and God's going to say, no, don't give to that person. And down the road, you'll find a brother in Christ, oh, I'm hurting and I, I need like $200 to pay a bill or um, to get food or something like that. Or, I, you know, or so maybe you only had $20 to give and God's like, wait, 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 hope. And then down the road, a brother in Christ needed gas and you took that $20 to help with gas. There's going to be times where you're going to come across the ministry that you're like, I'm, I don't know why, but I'm donating to this ministry. A good ministry, don't get me wrong. Don't be giving money to Bible perversions. Don't get money to these Bible buildings. But the whole point is, is it's supposed to be from your heart. You're supposed to do it from your heart. You don't do it because someone told you you had to do it. You do it because you want to. And I'm not using it the way they do. Well, you should want to. No, it just has to do with God's blessed you. Give some money back. God's overly blessed you. Give some money to, to good ministries. But there's people out there that are poor. They don't have money. Are, is God going to look at them differently because they didn't donate to ministries? No, He's not. Okay? They're just as good as people who do donate. Whoever has more, God's overly blessed. Those are the people that should be given back to the body of Christ and to ministries. I do believe in tithing. I do believe in donations. Just be careful, be careful, be careful of A, who you donate to. That's very important. You don't want to be promoting um, a, a people who put out uh, a false gospel. They don't believe in the King James Bible. Make sure it's a good ministry that's founded on the King James Bible. Secondly, if you start getting into ministry where you take money, remember you got to watch who you take money from. Okay? so important. Someone comes up and says, hey, I'll give you $100,000. If someone did that to me, I'd freeze and go, what's the catch? Something's up. What's going on? Why? Because, A, that's a lot of money, and why would somebody just come up and give me $100,000 just on the spot? Um, and I'm talking about, as an example, in a sense, if I was taking donations, which I'm not, it'd be like, wait a second, I don't expect someone to be paying that. You know, $20 here, there from a brother and sister in Christ. Yeah, that's one thing, but that's a lot of money. Where's it coming from? I'd be like, where's the money coming from? Who's giving it to me? you got to be careful who you take money from and who, who you be, get indebted to. Okay. Now, the last part is um, when you're saved and you get confident, you do it from the beginning, you start praying, you're going to start going around when you first get saved saying, God saved me, which is great. God saved me. Jesus saved me. I'm a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman now, um, whoever you are. And you're going to start preaching Jesus. So preaching the gospel is the biggest thing that you can do right now as a Christian is preaching the gospel. Okay? It is the most important thing you can do right now. We're in the last days. 
it is, we're just so close. God, I, so I can't see us being here at the end of next year uh, with how fast things are moving, but God knows when he's coming, but we need to have the attitude he can come back any moment. Um, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.18, And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given a, to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespass unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. In other words, we have the word of reconciliation. Jesus Christ, if you want to go to heaven and be reconciled to God, you have to go through Jesus Christ. We have the gospel. That's the word of reconciliation. We go out and we preach repentance towards God, the gospel, the belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And then once someone does that, we lead, a, we tell, we lead them, like tell them how to pray, confess both in prayer, call upon the name of the Lord to save you. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We are to be preaching the gospel. I've come across people who say, well, I don't feel like I'm called to preach the gospel. And my mouth just drops every time they say that. I'm like, did they really just say that? The moment you get saved, you're now part of the ministry of reconciliation. Every Bible-believing man or woman is called to preach the gospel. Now, I say preach, but you can hand out gospel tracts. Leave them everywhere. If you have a problem, like confrontation things, where you have a hard time with confrontation and don't have that much courage, leave gospel tracts everywhere. Make a video. You can have a lot of confidence behind a camera. I understand that. Make a video of the gospel and put it out on Facebook, on YouTube. And there's other programs to reach people. Uh, and then you'll get courage to hand out gospel tracts. Then God will give you the courage to talk to somebody. But don't be just sitting there studying the Bible saying, I'm a Christian for years and years and years, and never do one thing to get the gospel out there. We are all called into the ministry of reconciliation. We are all called. Okay. Most people who say they're not called to do that, um, they don't have the courage. And they don't realize that they don't have to actually physically talk to people right away. They can work their way into it. Okay, just hand out gospel tracts, I mean, lay gospel tracts everywhere. Bathrooms, you go to stores, leave them here and there, um, on people's cars. Uh, just the beach, there's certain places in the beach you can leave them, like in the, what is it, uh, where the dispensary is for the doggy bags, because I have a dog that I take for walks. Uh, there's places where you can slip in a gospel track here and there. I mean, there's so much you can do without actually having to verbally talk to people or confront somebody with the gospel. But eventually God will give you um, the courage to do that. Okay, sorry about that. Um, had to switch out batteries. So, we are talking about uh, preaching. Um, when you preach the gospel, the hard part that you're going to face is people that aren't seeking God and they won't drop their self-righteousness. We preach the gospel hoping and praying to come across that one person that is truly seeking God and is on the verge or has dropped their self-righteousness. Acts 17, 27, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Right? Seeking after God. Those who are seeking God, those are the ones you're going to be able to reach. And in these last days, um, I had a brother in Christ say that we're just keeping people accountable. That's why we're handing out gospel tracts left and right. We're just keeping people accountable. When they stand before God at the great white throne to be judged, God's, they can't say, I didn't know about the truth. Remember that gospel tract you picked up and read? That was the truth and you ignored it. Remember that guy? that Bible-believing man or that Bible-believing woman that told you the gospel and you just ignored him? Keeping people accountable. But we're also trying to find that one soul that still needs to get saved. That last soul, not one. The last soul that needs to get saved before God takes us home. Romans 2, 7. To them who by patience, continuance, and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Seek, 
uh, verse 7, do, in well-doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality. Seeking. Someone has to be seeking Jesus Christ. They, not specifically, I'm looking for Jesus, but they have to be seeking something. they got to be like, there's got to be more to this. There's got to be more to this. There's something that's just not right about me, about what this world is, what's going on in this world. There's just something. they got to be seeking. There's got to be more to this. What am I missing? What, what's the meaning of life? And they're seeking something. They're seeking God. They just don't know it. That's where we come in and say, do you know about Jesus Christ? Do you know that you're a sinner? That God can save you? That this world is filthy and wicked? That your flesh is filthy and wicked? You know what I'm saying? They have to be seeking. And that's the hardest thing in our when it comes to preaching the gospel, is coming across somebody who's not self-righteous and is truly seeking God. Uh, Romans 3.10 As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They have all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Okay. Like I said, self-righteousness. they got to realize there's everybody you come across, yeah, I've done bad things, but that doesn't make me a bad person. I'm still a good person. I'm a nice guy. They all, everybody at the bar thinks I'm great. Everybody at these battle buildings thinks I'm great. I'm awesome. I'm a great. I'm a good guy. They know I'm lost. They know I don't want anything to do with Jesus Christ because they invite lost people to these battle buildings. I mean, everybody at my work thinks I'm a great guy. My family members, they just think I'm great. Everybody thinks I'm great. I'm a good guy. What do I need with Jesus Christ? There's none that do with good. They haven't dropped their self-righteousness. And 2 Corinthians 4, 3, they have to seek God. Um, they have to find, if, if they have to seek God, it makes you think that, um, that they, right here, let's go through the verse first. For 2 Corinthians 4, 3, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So if the gospel can be hid, is what I'm trying to say, then it can be found. But it can only be found if somebody is seeking it. So the hardest thing you're going to deal with is self-righteous people that aren't seeking God. They don't want anything to do with God. And that's most of the people today. That's most of the people today. They don't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. So when preaching the gospel, what you're supposed to do as a Christian, whether you're doing it through written, like gospel tracts, through videos, through typing emails, through handing them out physically to people, to verbally witnessing to people, uh, door opening and God will open doors to you when you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody, uh, whether it's on the street, at work, family member, just walking on the beach, you get into a conversation with some stranger and the next thing you know, God opens the door and says, hey, there's a door open. Tell them about sin. Tell them about me. Tell them that there's a way to go to heaven. Tell them that there is a hell. You'll open a door. So. But you're gonna, it's going to be tough. I'm not saying that I've got all this courage. I'm still working on the verbally talking part. I can hand, I've gotten to the point where I can hand gospel tracts to somebody. But verbally, when they start hitting me with all these questions and this and that, and it's like you can tell within a few minutes that they want nothing to do with the gospel. And that's the hard part, so you're not getting stuck there for hours talking to somebody who really doesn't want anything to do with God. Uh, they're not seeking God, and they're not dropping their self-righteousness. They're just waste. They're taking up your time, casting pearls before swine, as the Bible says. Um, so we got that, and then another part of your walk with the Lord and your life as a Christian is going to be testimonies. Um, you're going to have your testimony of how you got saved, and then you're going to have testimonies as as your walk with your, the Lord continues. There's testimonies you have to the lost world to say, hey, I'm a Christian. Your walk with the Lord. You're going to have testimonies to the lost world saying, hey, I'm a Christian. This is what God did for me. And now I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. This is my changed life. And the lost world's going to see it. It's a testimony to the lost world. That helps when you testify on how God saved you. And the lost world sees a difference in you. They're going to look at you and go, I think I might want what they have. They got something. I don't know what it is, but they got something. They have peace when they shouldn't. They're, they're living without all this stuff that I can't stand to live without. How are they able to do that? You know, like movie, cable, movies, TV shows, alcohol. 
they said they used to smoke, but they gave it up. How are they able to do that? I can't seem to... And you know what I'm saying? There's a testimony you have to the lost world. The other testimony you have is to saved sinners. People say, what do you mean? Um, Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 11.26, he's given a testimony to save people. And journeys often uh, saying that he... If you read the whole thing, he's boasting, but he's doing it sarcastically. Because he says, if I have to boast, then here I go. It's not like he's doing it saying, hey, look at me. He's saying, uh, this is what's going to happen in the life of a Christian. You get saved, so it's partly to the loss. But if you get saved, this is what you're going to be going through. This is what I went through. So if any one of you are going through one of these things, know that you're not alone. I went through it. And journeys often, and perils of water, and perils of robbers and perils by mine own countrymen, family turning against you. Um, perils of robbers, uh, I've had someone break into my, my truck, steal my radio, and steal the armrest. Go figure on that one. And then leave a lot of the change in, that I had down there, like the money, they left a lot of the money there, they just stole the radio and my armrest. Okay. Um, and perils by heathen, by the heathen, how the lost world treats you. It's gonna, you're gonna have a change, the lost world's gonna treat you differently. And perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren. Okay? You're gonna realize as you walk with the Lord, um, Paul's gonna say, if you come across somebody that was false, you thought he was saved, because in order for Paul to say false brethren, they had to deceive Paul at first. They had to have deceived him. So you're going to be deceived by false brethren. And God's going to show you, hey, you were deceived. And you're going to be like, I'm such an idiot. I'm such a re... And then you look, read about Paul. And then Brother Brian comes out and says, hey, I was deceived by this person. I come out and say, I was deceived as a false Christian, you know, by all these false brethren. And was a... was never truly saved, part of this battle. You, and you look at that and go... Well, they were fooled, then I was fooled, that's something that's going to happen, and then they thank God for showing it to them, because I tell them, it's not just about being fooled, God showed me and opened my eyes, praise the Lord. And then they go from feeling bad, because of the testimony, and saying, I'm sorry that I was misled by that guy, but Lord, thank you for opening my eyes. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for opening my eyes, okay? It's called testimonies to encourage the brothers and sisters in Christ to do what's right. To stand for what's right. Let them know that no matter how tough it gets in your life, they're not alone. Other people have been there. God has gotten them out. God has saved me so many times in my life. God has helped me with so many things in my life. 27. In weariness and painfulness, my body just aches. And you look at somebody else and it's like, uh, they're in worse condition. You're like, and they tell you, hey, your body's going to ache. You're going to get older. Uh, if you lived in wicked sin before you got saved, uh, the, um, you're still going to have problems with the flesh. Okay? And weariness and painfulness. Studying up and reading the Bible a lot. Uh, doing the work of the Lord a lot. Uh, some people, they have to work a lot to support their families. You know? And um, it's just, it's a weariness. And it's painfulness. So you've, you, you've got people that go to work for 12 hours a day. They come home and... They're, they're struggling with their flesh and it's just getting overwhelming and they come across a brother in Christ that goes, you know what, I used to be in the same thing. This is what I did to help out. Or I'm in the same thing and right now and this is what I did to help out with my walk with the Lord, with my family. And you start getting a testimony from another brother in Christ and you, got, you start going, okay, I wasn't alone. I'm not the only one going through this. And he gave me some good advice to help me get through this. Okay? And watchings often, and hunger and thirst, and fastings often, and cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Okay. Testimonies. Okay, we've got to be getting testimonies out to the brothers and sisters in Christ, and we're supposed to have a good testimony. Peter Ruckman has a great um, study that I promote and I think I have it on my channel, uh, the seven things you can lose. And one of those things is your testimony. 
if you're saying God's Word says your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost, it's supposed to be without blemish, and you go out there doing things you're not supposed to, if I say, the best example is me, I always say that movies, not documentaries, um, I tried finding movies, but most movies, Hollywood movies, are evil and wicked, stay away from them. Video games are evil and wicked, stay away from them. There's always satanic ties in almost every game I've ever seen, no matter how innocent it looks. And it's all designed to take you away from the Lord and doing the work of the Lord and living your life here for the Lord. And um, then someone sees me go to a R-rated movie. They see me walk into an R-rated movie. I just hurt my testimony, destroyed it with that person. Or someone sees me playing video games at the arcade and everybody's like, yeah, we're playing it. After I said, you shouldn't be playing wicked games. You can lose your testimony to the world. So those are the two sides of the testimony. Your testimony that you have to the lost world and your testimony that you have to brothers and sisters in Christ. So that's very important in your life. Um, I believe in testimonies. They're good. Get not just a testimony on how you got saved, but living a, test, a good testimony to the lost world that they see a difference in you. They see the light in you, Jesus Christ, living in you. That, um, that you're sharing testimonies with brothers and sisters in Christ. Something big happens, um, God saves you. If you're having trouble asking for prayer, it goes back to the prayer thing. Asking brothers and sisters in Christ for prayer. So I just want to do a quick video explaining what we believe here. So it's easy for people to come by and say, okay, what does this man on this screen, Philip Newton, what does he believe? Okay, this is what I believe. So thank you for watching. I'm sorry it took a little bit longer than I intended to, but um, just going to keep pushing, get that gospel out there. I'm going to keep encouraging the brothers in Christ to, to pray, their prayer life to be healthy, to stay in the Word of God, to give their testimonies out there to encourage one another. But the big encouragement is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Preach it. Okay? Hand out gospel tracts. Get that out there. We've got to get people saved. Time is running out. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with all of my brothers and sisters in Christ out there. And my love for you in Christ Jesus. If you're lost, get saved today. If you're saved, get busy working for the Lord, doing something for the Lord. Get that gospel out there. I'll see you in the next video.